From deeps of sound sleep he awoke much later. He awoke suddenly and completely, and with that inner excitement that presages something momentous. He awoke to brilliant moonlight, turning the room so bright that he could see the scarlet of the girl's rags as she sat up on her pallet. She was awake. She was sitting with her shoulder half turned to him and her head bent, and some warning instinct crawled coldly up his spine as he watched what she was doing. And yet it was a very ordinary thing for a girl to do, any girl, anywhere. She was unbinding her turban. He watched, not breathing, a presentiment of something horrible stirring in his brain inexplicably. The red folds loosened, and he knew then that he had not dreamed. Again, a scarlet lock swung down against her cheek. A hair, was it? A lock of hair? Thick as a thick worm it fell, plumply, against that smooth cheek. More scarlet than blood, and as thick as a crawling worm. And like a worm, it crawled. Smith rose on an elbow, not realizing the motion, and fixed an unwinking stare with a sort of sick, fascinated incredulity on that that lock of hair. He had not dreamed. Until now he had taken it for granted that it was the whiskey which had made it seem to move on that evening before. But now it was lengthening, stretching, moving of itself. It must be hair, but it crawled. With a sickening life of its own, it squirmed down against her cheek, caressingly, revoltingly, impossibly. Wet it was, and round and thick and shining. She unfastened the last fold and whipped the turban off. From what he saw then, Smith would have turned his eyes away, and he had looked on dreadful things before without flinching, but he could not stir. He could only lie there on his elbow, staring at the mass of scarlet, squirming worms, hairs, what, that writhed over her head in a dreadful mockery of ringlets. And it was lengthening, falling, somehow growing before his eyes, down over her shoulders in a spilling cascade, a mass that even at the beginning could never have been hidden under the skull-tight turban she had worn. He was beyond wondering, but he realized that. And still it squirmed and lengthened and fell and she shook it out in a horrible travesty of a woman shaking out her unbound hair, until the unspeakable tangle of it, twisting and writhing, obscenely scarlet, hung to her waist and beyond and still lengthened, an endless mass of crawling horror that until now, somehow, impossibly, had been hidden under the tight-bound turban. It was like a nest of blind, restless red worms. It was like naked entrails endowed with an unnatural aliveness, terrible beyond words, Smith lay in the shadows, frozen without and within, in a sick numbness that came of utter shock and revulsion. She shook out the obscene, unspeakable tangle over her shoulders, and somehow he knew that she was going to turn in a moment and that he must meet her eyes. The thought of that meeting stopped his heart with dread, more awfully than anything else in this nightmare horror, for nightmare it must be, surely. He knew without trying that he could not wrench his eyes away. The sickening fascination of that sight held him motionless, and somehow there was a certain beauty. Her head was turning. The crawling awfulness rippled and squirmed at the motion, writhing thick and wet and shining over the soft brown shoulders about which they fell now in obscene cascades that all but hid her body. Her head was turning. Smith lay numb. And very slowly he saw the round of her cheek foreshorten, and her profile came into view all the scarlet horrors twisting ominously, and the profile shortened in turn, and her full face came slowly round toward the bed, moonlight shining brilliantly as day on the pretty girl face, smooth and sweet, framed in tangled obscenity that crawled. The green eyes met his. He felt a perceptible shock, and a shudder rippled down his paralyzed spine, leaving an icy numbness in its wake. He felt the goose flesh rising, but that numbness and cold horror he scarcely realized, for the green eyes were locked with his in a long, long look that somehow presaged nameless things, not altogether unpleasant things, the voiceless voice of her mind assailing him with little murmurous promises. For a moment he went down into a blind abyss of submission, and then somehow the very sight of that obscenity in eyes that did not realize they saw it was dreadful enough to draw him out of the seductive darkness, the sight of her crawling and alive with unnameable horror. She rose, and down about her in a cascade fell the squirming scarlet of, of what grew upon her head. It fell in a long, alive cloak to her bare feet on the floor, hiding her in a wave of dreadful, wet, writhing life. She put up her hands, and like a swimmer she parted the waterfall of it,
tossing the masses back over her shoulders to reveal her own brown body, sweetly curved. She smiled exquisitely, and in starting waves back from her forehead and down about her in a hideous background, writhed the snaky wetness of her living tresses, and Smith knew that he looked upon Medusa. The knowledge of that, the realization of vast backgrounds reaching into misted history, shook him out of his frozen horror for a moment, and in that moment he met her eyes again, smiling, green as glass in the moonlight, half-hooded under drooping lids. Through the twisting scarlet she held out her arms, and there was something soul-shakingly desirable about her, so that all the blood surged to his head suddenly and he stumbled to his feet like a sleeper in a dream as she swayed toward him, infinitely graceful, infinitely sweet in her cloak of living horror. And there was beauty in it, the wet scarlet writhings with moonlight sliding and shining along the thick worm-round tresses and losing itself in the masses, only to glint again and move silverly along writhing tendrils. An awful shuddering beauty more dreadful than any ugliness could be. But all this again he but half realized, for the insidious murmur was coiling again through his brain, promising, caressing, alluring, sweeter than honey, and the green eyes that held his were clear and burning like the depth of a jewel and behind the pulsing slits of darkness he was staring into a greater dark that held all things. He had known, dimly he had known, when he first gazed into those flat animal shallows, that behind them lay this, all beauty and terror, all horror and delight, in the infinite darkness upon which her eyes opened like windows paned with emerald glass. Her lips moved, and in a murmur that blended indistinguishably with the silence and the sway of her body and the dreadful sway of her, her hair, she whispered very softly, very passionately, I shall speak to you now in my own tongue, O oh beloved. And in her living cloak she swayed to him, the murmur swelling, seductive and caressing in his innermost brain, promising, compelling, sweeter than sweet. His flesh crawled to the horror of her, but it was a perverted revulsion that clasped what it loathed. His arm slid round her under the sliding cloak, wet and warm and hideously alive, and the sweet velvet body was clinging to his, her arms locked about his neck, and with a whisper and a rush the unspeakable horror closed about them both. In nightmares until he died he remembered that moment when the living tresses of Chamblot first folded him in their embrace. A nauseous smothering odor as the wetness shut round him, thick pulsing worms clasping every inch of his body, sliding, writhing, their wetness and warmth striking through his garments as if he stood naked to their embrace. All this in a graven instant, and after that a tangling flash of conflicting sensation before oblivion closed over him. For he remembered the dream, and knew it for a nightmare reality now and the sliding, gently moving caress of those wet, warm worms upon his flesh was an ecstasy above words, that deeper ecstasy that strikes beyond the body and beyond the mind and tickles the very roots of the soul with unnatural delight. So he stood, rigid as marble, as helplessly stony as any of Medusa's victims in ancient legends were, while the terrible pleasure of Chamblot thrilled and shuddered through every fiber of him, through every atom of his body and the intangible atoms of what men call the soul, through all it was Smith the dreadful pleasure ran, and it was truly dreadful. Dimly he knew it, even as his body answered to the root-deep ecstasy, a foul and dreadful wooing from which his very soul shuddered away. And yet in the innermost depths of that soul some grinning traitor shivered with delight. But deeply beyond all this he knew horror and revulsion and despair beyond all telling, while the intimate caresses crawled obscenely in the secret places of his soul knew that the soul should not be handled, and shook with a perilous pleasure through it all. And this conflict and knowledge, this mingling of rapture and revulsion, all took place in the flashing of a moment, while the scarlet worms coiled and crawled upon him, sending deep, obscene tremors of that infinite pleasure into every atom that made up Smith. And he could not stir in that slimy, ecstatic embrace, and a weakness was flooding that grew deeper after each succeeding wave of intense delight and the traitor in his soul strengthened and drowned out the revulsion, and something within him ceased to struggle as he sank wholly into a blazing darkness that was oblivious to all else but that devouring rapture. The young Venusian climbed the stairs to his friend's lodging room, pulled out his key absent-mindedly, a pucker forming between his fine brows. He was slim, as all Venusians are, as fair and sleek as any of them, 
and as with most of his countrymen, the look of cherubic innocence on his face was wholly deceptive. He had the face of a fallen angel without Lucifer's majesty to redeem it, for a black devil grinned in his eyes, and there were faint lines of ruthlessness and dissipation about his mouth, to tell of the long years behind him that had run the gamut of experiences and made his name next to Smith's the most hated and the most respected in the records of the patrol. He mounted the stairs now with a puzzled frown between his eyes. He had come into Lac Darrell on the noon liner to find in lamentable disorder the affairs he had expected to be settled, and cautious inquiry elicited the information that Smith had not been seen for three days. That was not like his friend. He had never failed before, and the two stood to lose not only a large sum of money, but also their personal safety, by the inexplicable lapse on the part of Smith. Yarrell could think of one solution only. If fate had at last caught up with his friend, nothing but physical disability could explain it. Still puzzling, he fitted his key in the lock and swung the door open. In that first moment, as the door opened, he sent something very wrong. The room was darkened, and for a while he could see nothing but at the first breath he scented a strange, unnameable odor, half sickening, half sweet, and deep stirrings of ancestral memory awoke in him, ancient swamp-born memories from Venusian ancestors far away and long ago. Yarrell laid his hand on his gun lightly and opened the door wider. In the dimness all he could see at first was a curious mound in the far corner. Then his eyes grew accustomed to the dark, and he saw it more clearly, a mound that somehow heaved and stirred within itself. A mound of... He caught his breath sharply. A mound like a mass of entrails, living, moving, writhing with an unspeakable aliveness. Then a hot Venusian oath broke from his lips, and he cleared the door sill in a swift stride, slammed the door and set his back against it, gun ready in his hand, although his flesh crawled, for he knew. Smith, he said softly, in a voice thick with horror. Northwest? The moving mass stirred, shuddered, sank back into crawling quiescence again. Smith, Smith! The Venusian's voice was gentle and insistent, and it quivered a little with terror. An impatient ripple went over the whole mass of aliveness in the corner. It stirred again reluctantly, and then tendril by writhing tendril it began to part itself and fall aside, and very slowly the brown of a spaceman's leather appeared beneath it, all slimed and shining. Smith, northwest! Yarrell's persistent whisper came again urgently, and with a dreamlike slowness the leather garments moved, and a man sat up in the midst of the writhing worms, a man who once long ago might have been Northwest Smith. From head to foot he was slimy from the embrace of the crawling horror about him. His face was like that of some creature beyond humanity, dead alive, fixed in a gray stare, and the look of terrible ecstasy that overspread it seemed to come from somewhere far within, a faint reflection from immeasurable distances beyond the flesh. And as there is mystery and magic in the moonlight, which is, after all, but a reflection of the everyday sun, so in that gray face turned to the door was a terror unnameable and sweet, a reflection of ecstasy beyond the understanding of any who have known only earthly ecstasy themselves. And as he sat there turning a blank eyeless face to Yarrell, the red worms writhed ceaselessly about him very gently, with a soft, caressing motion that never slacked. Smith! Come here, Smith, get up, Smith, Smith. Yarrell's whisper hissed in the silence, commanding, urgent, but he made no move to leave the door. And with a dreadful slowness, like a dead man rising, Smith stood up in the nest of slimy scarlet. He swayed drunkenly on his feet, and two or three crimson tendrils came writhing up his legs to the knees and wound themselves there supportingly, moving with a ceaseless caress that seemed to give him hidden strength. For he said then, without inflection, Go away, go away. Leave me alone. And the dead, ecstatic face never changed. Smith! Yarrell's voice was desperate. Smith, listen. Smith, can't you hear me? Go away, the monotonous voice said. Go away. Go away. Go. Not unless you come too. Can't you hear? Smith! Smith, I'll... He hushed in mid-phrase, and once more the ancestral prickle of race memory shivered down his back, for the scarlet mass was moving again, violently, rising... Yarrell pressed back against the door and gripped his gun, and the name of a god he had forgotten years ago rose to his lips unbidden, for he knew what was coming next, and the knowledge was more dreadful than any ignorance could have been. The red writhing mass rose higher, and the tendrils parted, and a human face looked out, no, half-human, with green cat eyes that shone in that dimness like lighted jewels, compellingly.
Yarold breathed shar again and flung up an arm across his face, and the tingle of meeting that green gaze for even an instant went thrilling through him perilously. Smith, he called in despair. Smith, can't you hear me? Go away, said the voice that was not Smith's. Go away. And somehow, although he dared not look, Yarol knew that the the other had parted those worm-thick tresses and stood there in all the human sweetness of the brown, curved woman's body, cloaked in living horror. And he felt the eyes upon him, and something was crying insistently in his brain to lower that shielding arm. He was lost, he knew it, and the knowledge gave him that courage which comes from despair. The voice in his brain was growing, swelling, deafening him with a roaring command that all but swept him before it, command to lower that arm, to meet the eyes that opened upon darkness, to submit, and a promise, murmurous and sweet and evil beyond words, of pleasure to come. But somehow he kept his head. Somehow, dizzily, he was gripping his gun in his upflung hand. Somehow, incredibly, crossing the narrow room with averted face, groping for Smith's shoulder. There was a moment of blind fumbling and emptiness, and then he found it, and gripped the leather that was slimy and dreadful and wet, and simultaneously he felt something loop gently about his ankle, and a shock of repulsive pleasure went through him, and then another coil and another wound about his feet. Yarrell set his teeth and gripped the shoulder hard, and his hand shuddered of itself, for the feel of that leather was slimy as the worms about his ankles, and a faint tingle of obscene delight went through him from the contact. That caressing pressure on his leg was all he could feel, and the voice in his brain drowned out all other sounds, and his body obeyed him reluctantly. But somehow he gave one heave of tremendous effort and swung Smith stumbling out of that nest of horror. The twining tendrils ripped loose with a little sucking sound, and the whole mass quivered and reached after. And then Yarrell forgot his friend utterly and turned his whole being to the hopeless task of freeing himself, for only a part of him was fighting now. Only a part of him struggled against the twining obscenities, and in his innermost brain the sweet seductive murmur sounded, and his body clamored to surrender. Shar, shar yidana, shar marol, arol, prayed Yarrow, gasping and half-conscious that he spoke, boys' prayers that he had forgotten years ago. And with his back half-turned to the central mass, he kicked desperately with his heavy boots at the red writhing worms about him. They gave back before him, quivering and curling themselves out of reach, and though he knew that more were reaching for his throat from behind, at least he could go on struggling until he was forced to meet those eyes. He stamped and kicked and stamped again, and for one instant he was free of the slimy grip as the bruised worms curled back from his heavy feet, and he lurched away dizzily, sick with revulsion and despair as he fought off the coils. And then he lifted his eyes and saw the cracked mirror on the wall. Dimly in its reflection he could see the writhing scarlet horror behind him, its face peering out with a demure girl smile, dreadfully human, and all the red tendrils reaching after him. And remembrance of something he had read long ago swept incongruously over him, and the gasp of relief and hope that he gave shook for a moment the grip of the command in his brain. Without pausing for a breath, he swung the gun over his shoulder, the reflected barrel in line with the reflected horror in the mirror, and flicked the catch. In the mirror he saw its blue flame leap in a dazzling spate across the dimness, full into the midst of that squirming, reaching mass behind him. There was a hiss and a blaze and a high, thin scream of inhuman malice and despair. The flame cut a wide arc and went out as the gun fell from his hand, and Yarrell pitched forward to the floor. Northwest Smith opened his eyes to Martian sunlight streaming thinly through the dingy window. Something wet and cold was slapping his face, and the familiar fiery sting of Seagir whiskey burnt his throat. Smith, Yarrell's voice was saying from far away, Wake up, damn you, wake up! "'I'm awake,' Smith managed to articulate thickly. "'What's the matter?' Then a cup rim was thrust against his teeth, and Yarrell said irritably, "'Drink it, you fool!' Smith swallowed obediently, and more of the fire-hot whiskey flowed down his grateful throat. It spread a warmth through his body that awakened him from the numbness that had gripped him until now, and helped a little toward driving out the all-devouring weakness he was becoming aware of slowly. He lay still for a few minutes while the warmth of the whiskey went through him, and memory sluggishly began to permeate his brain with the spread of the sea gear. Nightmare memories, sweet and terrible, memories of... God! gasped Smith suddenly, and tried to sit up. Weakness smote him like a blow, and for an instant the room wheeled as he fell back against something firm and warm, 
Yarl's shoulder. The Venusian's arm supported him while the room steadied, and after a time he twisted a little and stared into the other's black gaze. Yarl was holding him with one arm and finishing the mug of Sigir himself, and the black eyes met his over the rim and crinkled into sudden laughter, half hysterical after the terror that was past. By feral, Northwest, I'm never going to let you forget this. Next time you have to drag me out of a mess, I'll say, let it go, said Smith. What's been going on? How? It was Chamblot. Yarl's laughter died. Chamblot, what were you doing with a thing like that? What was it, Smith asked again. You mean to say you don't know? But where'd you find it? Suppose you tell me first what you know, said Smith firmly. And another swig of that sea gear, too, please. I need it. Can you hold the mug now? Feel better? Yeah, some. I can hold it. Thanks. Now go on. Well, I don't know just where to start. They call them Chamblot. Good God, is there more than one? It's a s sort of race, I think, one of the very oldest. Where they come from, nobody knows. There have always been Chamblots. I never heard of them. Not many people have, and those who know don't talk about it much. Well, half this town knows. Yes, it happens like this sometimes. They'll appear, and the news will spread, and the town will get together and hunt them down. And after that, well, the story doesn't get around very far. It's just too unbelievable. But my God, Yarrow, what was it? Where did it come from? Nobody knows just where they come from. Another planet, maybe some undiscovered one. Some say Venus. I know there's some rather awful legends of them handed down in our family. And the minute I opened that door a while back, I, I think I knew that smell. But what are they? God knows. Not human, though they have the human form. Or maybe that's only an illusion. Or maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. They're a species of vampire. Or maybe the vampire is a species of, of them. Their normal form must be that mass. And in that form they draw nourishment from the, I suppose, the life forces of men. And they take some form, usually a woman form, I think, and they key you up to the highest pitch of emotion before they begin. And they give always that horrible, foul pleasure as they feed. There are some men who, if they survive the first experience, take to it like a drug, can't give it up, keep the thing with it all their lives, which isn't long, feeding it for that ghastly satisfaction. Yes, said Smith, I'm beginning to understand why that crowd was so surprised and, and disgusted when I... Well, never mind. Go on. Did you get to talk to... to it? asked Yarrow. I tried to. It couldn't speak very well. I asked it where it came from, and it said, from far away and long ago, something like that. I wonder. Possibly some unknown planet, but I think not. You know, there are so many wild stories with some basis of fact to start from that I've sometimes wondered. Mightn't there be a lot more of even worse and wilder superstitions we've never even heard of? Things like this, blasphemous and foul, that those who know have to keep still about. Awful, fantastic things running around loose that we never hear rumors of at all. These things, they've been in existence for countless ages. No one knows when or where they first appeared. Those who've seen them as we saw this one don't talk about it. It's just one of those vague, misty rumors you find half-hinted in old books sometimes. I believe they're an older race than man, spawned from ancient seed in times before our own, perhaps on planets that have gone to dust, and so horrible to man that when they are discovered, the discoverers keep still about it, forget them again as quickly as they can, and they go back to time immemorial. I suppose you recognize the legend of Medusa. There isn't any question the ancient Greeks knew of them. Does it mean that there have been civilizations before yours that set out from Earth and explored other planets? Or did one of the Chamblots somehow make its way into Greece thousands of years ago? If you think about it long enough, you'll go off your head. I wonder how many other legends are based on things like this, things we don't suspect, things we'll never know. The Gorgon now, Medusa, a beautiful woman with, with snakes for hair and a gaze that turned men to stone. And Perseus finally killed her. I remember this just by accident, N.W., and it saved your life and mine. Perseus killed her by using a mirror as he fought to reflect what he dared not look at directly. I wonder what the old Greek who first started that legend would have thought if he'd known that 3,000 years later his story would save the lives of two men on another planet. I wonder what that Greek's own story was and how he met the thing and what happened. Well, there's a lot we'll never know. Wouldn't the record of that race of, of things, whatever they are, be worth reading? Records of other planets and other ages and all the beginnings of mankind. But I don't suppose they've kept any records. I don't suppose they even have any place to keep them. 
from what little I know or anybody knows about it. They're like the wandering Jew, just bobbing up here and there at long intervals. And where they stay in the meantime, I'd give my eyes to know. I don't believe that terribly hypnotic power they have indicates any superhuman intelligence. It's their means of getting food, just like a frog's long tongue or a carnivorous flower's odor. These are physical because the frog and the flower eat physical food. The Chamblot uses um, a mental reach to get mental food. I don't quite know how to put it. Just as a beast that eats the bodies of other animals acquires with each meal greater power over the bodies of the rest, so the Chamblot, stoking itself up with the life forces of men, increases its power over the minds and souls of other men. But I'm talking about things I can't define, things I'm not sure exist. I only know that when I felt when those tentacles closed around my legs, I didn't want to pull loose. I felt sensations that, that, oh, I'm fouled and filthy to the very deepest part of me by that pleasure. And yet, I know, said Smith slowly, the effect of the seeger was beginning to wear off, and weakness was washing back over him in waves. And when he spoke, he was half meditating in a low voice, scarcely realizing that Yarrow listened. I know it much better than you do. And there's something so indescribably awful that the thing emanates, something so utterly at odds with everything human, there aren't any words to say it. For a while I was part of it, literally, sharing its thoughts and memories and emotions and hungers, and, well, it's over now, and I don't remember very clearly, but the only part left free was that part of me that was all but insane from the, the obscenity of the thing. And yet it was a pleasure so sweet... I think there must be some nucleus of utter evil in me, in everyone, that needs only the proper stimulus to get complete control. Because even while I was sick all through from the touch of those things, there was something in me that was, was simply gibbering with delight. Because of that I saw things, and knew things, horrible, wild things I can't quite remember. Visited unbelievable places, looked backward through the memory of that creature I was one with, and saw... God, I wish I could remember. You ought to thank your God you can't, said Yarrell soberly. His voice roused Smith from the half-trance he had fallen into, and he rose on his elbow, swaying a little from weakness. The room was wavering before him, and he closed his eyes, not to see it. But he asked, You say they, they don't turn up again? No way of finding another? Yarrell did not answer for a moment. He laid his hands on the other man's shoulders and pressed him back, and then sat staring down into the dark, ravaged face with a new, strange, undefinable look upon it that he had never seen there before, whose meaning he knew too well. Smith, he said finally, and his black eyes for once were steady and serious, and the little grinning devil had vanished from behind them. Smith, I've never asked your word on anything before, but I've... I've earned the right to do it now, and I'm asking you to promise me one thing... Smith's colorless eyes met the black gaze unsteadily. Irresolution was in them, and a little fear of what that promise might be. And for just a moment, Yarrell was looking not into his friend's familiar eyes, but into a wide gray blankness that held all horror and delight, a pale sea with unspeakable pleasures sunk beneath it. Then the wide stare focused again, and Smith's eyes met his squarely, and Smith's voice said, "'Go ahead, now promise.' that if you should ever meet a Chamblot again, ever, anywhere, you'll draw your gun and burn it to hell the instant you realize what it is. Will you promise me that? There was a long silence. Yarrow's somber black eyes bored relentlessly into the colorless ones of Smith, not wavering. And the veins stood out on Smith's tanned forehead. He never broke his word. He had given it perhaps half a dozen times in his life, but once he had given it, he was incapable of breaking it. And once more the gray seas flooded in a dim tide of memories, sweet and horrible beyond dreams. Once more Smith was staring into blankness that hid nameless things. The room was very still. The gray tide ebbed. Smith's eyes, pale and resolute as steel, met Yarrell's levelly. I'll try, he said, and his voice wavered.